Buju, Alexandra Indigena Cause, Alex Dush Indigena Kanagu, Kiganawe Kashakwa, Meskwaki Winakazo, Meskwaki Settlement, and Dujaba Mako and Dude. Hello, my name is Alexandra Joel Black Day Walker. I go by Alex. My Meskwaki name is Grizzly Bear Woman, and I'm part of the Bear Clan. And I'm a member of the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi and Iowa, also known as Meskwaki. So, when the Europeans crossed the Atlantic to the so-called New World, they found a land that was occupied by millions of indigenous people. With their arrival, they brought, they brought greed, genocide, violence that resulted in traumas that are still prevalent to this day. I propose that we heal ourselves through the Creator's Game, because when we pick up our sticks, we're not only healing ourselves, we're, honor we're honoring our ancestors and reclaiming the game as its original players. So lacrosse doesn't only provide an outlet for everyday stress, it also helps with internal pain and the traumas that we carry within ourselves. Lacrosse was the very first game that we played. Every tribe had some type of variation of the game. Um, so it was given to us, it's called the Creator's Game because it was given to us by the Creator for ceremonial and social purposes. There's many different origin stories. I've heard a lot of different legends and stories, some that were given to us by the Thunder Beings, also ones that animals played at first. For the Meskwaki, I, was, I read that we were given, a spirit came to us and we were given a red leather ball and um, a lacrosse stick. And they said it would be our game and we were meant to teach it to everyone else, but of course, every tribe has a different story. So, lacrosse was originally a healing game. It was meant for those who were sick and were in need of prayers. You'd put your thoughts and your prayers into the ball and into the game, and you would play hard. The outcome didn't matter as long as we were working on healing a person. It was also used to settle disputes and to gamble. Um, it was taken away from us because a lot of religious missionaries didn't think that was right, and they thought it was also too violent because when you play, you like give out what you can take. So my first encounter with lacrosse was um, my sister actually went to Dartmouth and she brought me back a shirt that said Dartmouth lacrosse and it had a modern lacrosse stick on it. So I was like, oh, that's super cool. I was like, oh, it's an Ivy League sport. And I think that's what a lot of people think is that it's an elitist East Coast prep school sport and like played by the Ivy Leagues, but it's actually our original game. So I moved to Minneapolis about three years ago in 2015, and my sister Helen invited me to go play women's lacrosse. And I said no for about six months, but she was persistent. And then I finally said yes, and it kind of changed my life. Like the first time I picked up a stick, because always, I've always been an athlete. I've always done cross country. I've always done dance and tennis, but like never any contact sports. So I was like, oh yeah, I don't want to play that. But then, like, the first time I picked up a stick, it was actually super easy, and I feel like that's probably because it's part of my, like, ancestral memory and, like, my ancestral blood because the Meskwaki were playing it for a very long time. So that changed my life. Over here you can see those are modern lacrosse sticks. These are Iroquoian lacrosse sticks. This is what we play with here. These are the Western Great Lakes style lacrosse sticks. And over here, these are stickball sticks, and you play with two of them, and it's a southeastern game. So I think it should be known, not all tribes allow women to play lacrosse. I can't speak for those tribes that are like that. But for example, this was at um, Black River Falls with the Ho-Chunk. And it was the men's lacrosse tournament and a women's double ball tournament. So double ball was kind of similar to lacrosse. You still, there's still the same rules. You still score on the same goal post, but you play with a stick that's about this long, like that, but bigger. And then with a ball, two balls on a string. So all of these stick games embody, um, all of these <laughs> embody tribes' value systems, such as respect for yourself, for your opponents, for the game, and for our ancestors. Um, it's also about family community because it brings together people of all ages. Like in a, in a single game, there can be children, teenagers, adults, and elders. And then it's also, of course, great for your mental and physical health. It's a great stress reliever. And it also heals trauma, because by revitalizing the game, you're also releasing that trauma. And it's also a great way to remain sober and be surrounded by a healthy community. So according to Maria Yellowhurst Braveheart, historical trauma is cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations, including a lifespan which emanates from massive group trauma. So. As we all know, all of us are familiar with American Indian studies. Kind of like dealing and reading about that stuff every single day can be really hard. It can be mentally and emotionally exhausting to read about it because we're all aware 
of the awful things, but dealing with it every day is really hard. Um, so I think lacrosse is a great way to like release that. Um, a year ago, I was diagnosed with chronic PTSD. Um, I was shocked by that diagnosis. When I think of PTSD, I kind of like think of people like my dad, for instance. He's a Vietnam veteran. He's seen combat. So I just kind of thought PTSD was for people who've been in combat, who served in the military, who's seen violence, who's seen death. I didn't think that was myself. But then after research, I realized that PTSD is actually a lot more common within indigenous peoples than I thought. Because Native people as a whole are at a greater risk than any other ethno-racial group for experiencing traumatic life events than the general population, and are twice as likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder when compared with the general population. And then many scholars um, compare American Indian trauma to the Jewish Holocaust survivors because we experience the same issues, issues such as high rates of suicide, homicide, accidental deaths, domestic violence, child abuse, addiction, and poverty from loss of lives, land, language, and culture. So with the prohibition of indigenous spiritual practices, many cultural practices of dealing with grief were lost. Um, Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart says that bringing back traditional healing practices such as Lakota ceremonies, which are wiping of the tears and releasing of the spirit helped to resolve grief. And another scholar, Tsozi, says active involvement with traditional culture and support from one's tribal community and family are key to recovery, as well as learning one's language as medicine. So I propose that we use lacrosse and then incorporate lax with traditional healing procedures because of its benefits and its original intent as a healing game. This picture missing. <laughs> okay, um, so for my project, I decided to make a Western Great Lakes style lacrosse stick. Um, I asked Beige or David Butler from South High and Great Lakes Lacrosse to help me because the first stick I was ever given as a gift was actually a stick made by him and it was like really important to me. So he taught us how to make this using a draw horse and a draw knife. So with a piece of ash, I carved this out and then. And then we used an industrial steamer to bend it. And we kept it clamped for about two weeks, but you only have to clamp it for maybe a little less than one week. And then we drilled holes in it. And then we tied it together with sinew. And then we put leather in it to make the pocket. So this is more of a decorative piece because this is my first stick, so I kind of just want to keep it to myself. And this is more of a stick that I actually play with. As you can see, they're a lot lighter. I kept the bark on because I liked how it looked and I didn't make it as thin. So I, pro I might just play with it to get a game in and then hang it up. <laughs> None of my pictures are showing up. I have more pictures on here. No, I can see it on here, too. <laughs> Go to the next slide. OK, we can just leave it at this. OK, so my. So my other pictures actually showed us playing on Bidet Unma, which is like Harriet, just to show that you can play on ice. Like you can, it's a sport you can play year round, which is great. And then, so lacrosse has just been really important for me. It's gave me a really healthy community. When I first moved here, I was really shy. I just wanted to stay inside all the time. I didn't do much. But then I went to women's lacrosse and it was full, like, the women, they're really smart. They're strong. They're great role models. They're a great community to be around. And then I also met my partner, Chris. So lacrosse has really done a lot for me. And so I just think <laughs> it's a great game. <laughs> OK, so I say to ensure healthy generations and break the cycle of perpetuating that trauma, we must work on ourselves and give ourselves time and space to grieve and heal. It's important to recognize that trauma does not define us, but we do have an obligation to work on that trauma and heal it. Um, lacrosse offers a return to traditional ways of life. Playing an ancestral game is a way to honor those who came before you while continuing on tradition and being aware of the land on which we play in, which is Dakota. Historical trauma need not only grief and west or historical trauma and grief need not only Western medicine but traditional medicine, and I believe lacrosse is medicine. Thank you. Miigwech. <laughs>
God, I'm gonna fall over. <laughs> Get that 911 going. <laughs> I think I turned on mute. Okay, I'll start over. Um, Ani in Buju, Cindy and Dishnakas, Gawain Mashi, or Jewe Tazian, and De Yazin. Hello, my name is Cindy. Um, I don't have an Indian name yet. Um, I'm from the Turtle Clan and I'm from Minneapolis. And I'm going to be talking about these two revitalization of culture. Um, and start off as like, like a grain of sand makes a beach, like a language makes the past culture alive or how a canoe can make a society grow. It all starts with a bead, a bead with a purpose. The purpose is of, to revitalization of my culture. Here we go, a little simile to Cindy. Hey. <laughs> Start off there. <laughs> my grandpa, my mom, and my grandma, they were, my grandpa was a dancer, so that's where I came to be a dancer too. Um, just keeping traditions alive. My grandma spoke Ojibwe, but we lost our, our language because my mom could only understand it. She couldn't speak it, so that's how we lost it. We were from the Red Lake Reservation there. And um, I was at a Catholic school. That's the first, I didn't really want to, that was Thanksgiving, and I didn't know I didn't want to dress up in like that. So, yeah. <laughs> but my mom made me. <laughs> and today, Yep, I'm not a costume. Costumes are for clowns. <laughs> <laughs> and now yep, I wanted to wear a real outfit, so yes, I'm very proud to be a Native American right now. And it's good to be in revitalization for our culture, and this is one of the ways, too, is through the canoe, and I didn't realize how important it is to our culture. It's part of us as, as Ojibwe people, for revitalization is for the canoe, as part of the Ojibwe, is the birch bark canoe, and that was a part of our lives, and it's, it's good to be a part of this, too. Um, and it's also good to be, um, help the kids with uh, making ribbon skirts here, at, um, at the center here. Just like a bead for an outfit, a piece of ribbon will start something for a project. It's always something that starts something. So like a piece of ribbon, and then to a bead for me. Beads and how we bought, but first I'm gonna tell you how we actually got beads. According to Peter Nabokov, in the 15th century, as tim timber, fear-bearing animals, and other natural resources became scarce in the old world, Europeans looked across the sea for raw materials. Before long, the French, the English, the Dutch later started trading with the indigenous people of the United States. And then as early as 
the 1500s, Native Americans obtained beads. It's something that we can't make, so we actually had to trade for it. So that's something we can't make. So here we are trading with it, and then different, you know, we obtained them in the Minnesota area within the early 1900s. So um, beads, we can now be buying by the tube, the hank, or the bag of beads. And we don't have to wait for a local trading post anymore. We can just do it a click of the web here. <laughs> you can get your beads online. <laughs> there's different styles of beads. You got hex of beads, bags, and then yep. So there's different types of beads too, because there's it can get a little complicated. There's different sizes too, but I don't get too deep into that right now, because I'm gonna be talking about. Um, oh no. Oh, there we go. Okay. These are the materials used to be on. We can use Pellon. That's for little small pieces. For really, um, just for the edging, so you can do the edging. We, got, we still beat on leather, and we, have, we still beat on, or now, contemporary, we'll beat on either canvas or jean material right now. And the things I'm going to be making, I made my moccasins, and this is what the materials I needed. I needed needles, needle and thread. Um, I work with size 10 beads, so I'm going to use a size thread D thread. It's actually a parachute thread to use, so it's really strong. So I believe they could depend their life on that. So yeah, I can pin my beads on that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then yet we need wax for just to strengthen our thread there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach uh, two different styles I actually use. So this is one style, lazy stitch. It's a really quick method to fill in, a, to fill in areas for, uh, within a short amount of time. This technique is mostly used for moccasins and large pieces and outfits like part of like regalias would be like the, the traditional pieces, the harnesses, the side drops, the belts, you know, big pieces would be, be good for uh, lazy stitch. So you can also do flat work too though can be done that way too, but also flat work is very time consuming because you're only using a couple pieces of beads and it's actually you're doing really detailed work. You just need to actually, yeah, it takes a long time because it's really flat and it, it's really time consuming for the detailed work that you're going to put into it. Mm, this is both styles. I use for my bead work all the time because I usually use the flat stitch for mostly the design and then the filler will be the lazy stitch part for the filling part. And I'm just going to show you how I actually made these moccasins here. We start with the flat stitch here. I would pick up four beads and then put, lay them down, go through it, come up again. I'm going to go through or come up again, go through two, and then lay down, and then lay down four more, and then lay down. Then it's going to go all the way around, and I'm just going to do that all the way through the design there. So you're just going to be picking some up, laying down, going, picking up, and going through it. And it's going to go like that within, that's a flat stitch. It's really time consuming. But to the quicker part of it too, you can actually start filling in, lay a big bunch down, go through two, and just kind of tack them down as you go along. And that kind of goes real quick after you get going a little bit on your design there. And now I'm going to demonstrate the, the lazy stitch. I'm using it for, because beads will be different sizes for different kind of styles of beads you're going to get. For the regular C bead, I will pick up 10 of them, but for the black beads, I only pick up eight because of the, the size difference for them. And I'll go through the material, pick up 10, and just go through, and then pick 10 up more, and then go through on the bottom, and then just keep going like that through, all the way through the design. And... Lazy stitch, yep, and I'm filling in, I'm finally getting farther to the part where I'm just filling in the inside part of it, so that's pretty cool. And then the detail, I have to do the corners real, because you, know, you really have to do it like, I don't know, I kind of have to go in and out through the, the, the tiny part, but then as soon as I get to the sides of the rims, I can just do all lazy stitch within that area, within that time frame. And then it's, yeah, it gets a little bit easier as you get going. And just kind of filling it in here at towards the end here. And then I'm going to put the bottoms on. And I'm going to put sinew. I have to break up the sinew, and you're going to use a leather needle for that. And then you're going to go all the way around. Start on the top, usually by your toe, and I'll go this way. 
we're going to come around this way because you want to make sure it's going to be front, make sure it's not going to go sideways or anything on you. So, And then you're going to flip them after you do that. They'll be very delicate so your beads don't pop. And then you're just kind of flipping them in. And ta-da, here we go. We got pure moccasins here. <laughs> it doesn't even simple as it looks. <laughs> yeah. I did some hours on that to do that, so that was pretty uh, awesome to do that. So it was pretty cool. My old ones were kind of really flimsy and they were kind of too big on the side, and I really needed some that were tight fitting so I can really get my little groove down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is the reason why the bead is so important. We have to revitalize our our culture, make it for our future generations. This is my little grandbaby sewing through Tiny Tot to, um, to little boys. It's, it's, we have to keep our culture alive, and this is the way of doing it. And teaching them about the canoe and keeping them in the piles and showing them this is our culture. This is, we have to keep this alive through different generations, through my mom and through another generation, my brother's little girl. I'm going to teach her how to dance as soon as she starts walking, so she's going to be the next generation. Because I don't have no little girl, so this would be pretty fun to do it too. So, so we're being generations, like future and past, and future and now present. These are my boys through, through the years, and my son Don, I've been in this right here. Thank you so much for being here. And this is the reason why episode, Red Sky gave me sore, my grandbaby, and then Donovan, he also is a very good OJB speaker, so we are revitalizing our culture, and that's, this is how we're doing it. And this is Red Sky as a kid, there's two generations now sore, and I'm teaching him, and someday I will teach his kids how, you know, to keep our culture alive, as in together, as in as long as I'm alive, I will keep teaching him and future generations in my family. I'm going to recite this little poem I made. Um, Soaring is Indian. Grandma, they said I wasn't Indian at school. Honey, you are. Just they don't have none where you live. Grandma, I know, but they won't believe me, and I tried to tell them. Honey, this is why we learn our language and dance and keep our traditions alive. Grandma, my outfit is itchy and I don't want to dance. Honey, Grandma will make you a new one. I want it whiter at the bottom and my shirt is itchy. <laughs> I finish arguing with him, make him get dressed. Hey, laughs out loud. Soon he will realize how precious our culture is. Someday he will see what I see. Today he will play with his classmates as equals. Tomorrow he will be segregated in the minority. Yesterday, he thought himself as Mexican. In the future, he will be both. Grandma, I am Indian, too. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you so much. <laughs> Here's the moccasins I made. And this is a piece that my dad made, the first piece of beadwork I ever saw. So this is my dad made this a long time ago. Thank you, Miigwech. Jacob and Dijnikaz, Hugo and Da. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you all are well today. My name is Jacob. Um, I'm Miti. My family is from the Red River Settlement. And I'd like to start off my presentation by asking three questions. And if your answer is yes, please raise your hand. Who here has been on a canoe? Awesome. Who here has been on an indigenous canoe? 
Okay. Now who here has built an indigenous canoe or helped build one? Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I was hoping for more, but hey, we're getting there, right? Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, indigenous canoes and uh, the impacts that they have on indigenous communities and their youth. Um, canoe resurgence has been going on for decades, um, with one of the most notable being the Hokalea, which is a double hull Polynesian canoe that set sail in 1975 from Hawaii to Tahiti. Um, another great example of canoe resurgence is Canoe Journeys, which started in 1989, and it's where a, a conglomerate of uh, native peoples and indigenous peoples from all over the world get together on the west coast and, and go on a, a canoe journey to, to just get together and, and learn about each other's uh, cultures and heritages. Um, and then kind of like individually, uh, a lot of uh, nations and tribes are doing their own part. Um, the Ojibwe, uh, the Dakota, the Suquamish, and the Chinook, as, many, as well as many others, are uh, making sure that water crafts continue to be uh, passed down to the next generations. Um, so this famous professor I know always asks a question in class. Um, <laughs> why canoes? The question is, why canoes? And um, the research that I've done has shown that among all the, all the, I hate to say trials, but like what, what people are just like documenting um, is found that there's been multiple physical, <laughs> uh, mental, and, and spiritual benefits to, to building canoes and learning about canoes. Um, there's been lots of workshops around uh, the world that are, are building canoes with youth and are getting the connections between youth and elders so that way these traditions can keep being passed down. And then um, prevention and healing from substance abuse um, by using canoes as a vessel instead of those things um, is also a big benefit. Um, while researching all this has been really fascinating, I'd really like to take the rest of my time here today to talk about my personal experiences with students here at the U and with other youth. Um, so with that, I don't know why it's not working the way I, I planned on it. Um, but so uh, myself and some other students in the room here were able to go and harvest uh, materials for a birch bark canoe that hopefully we'll be getting soon. Uh, with Jim Jones, who is up in Cass Lake, um, we, were, we were showing how to find the roots, how to uh, s properly remove them without damaging the tree, and then um, how to basically bundle it up so you can store it until you're ready to use them. Uh, through, through AIS, and specifically Dr. Vince Diaz, I've had some great opportunities to have hands-on learning experiences. Um, we've, uh, we've gone to different com native communities around the state from Prairie Island and Mille Lacs to Lower Sioux. And one of the more recent trips that we took was down to Lower Sioux um, where Matt Pendleton was uh, kind enough to, to show us the dugout canoe that he had uh, acquired and had made. And um, Dr. Diaz had brought his uh, Micronesian outrigger canoe. Um, so to be able to, to converge those two canoes and those traditions and, and learn from each other was, was really great. Um, it was also interesting to see the, the comfortable comfortability of some people, and, but mostly the uncomfortable, uncomfortability of others um, to, to get into the water. Um, we were on the, the, uh, the what's it called? Sorry. The Redwood River, um, and the current was super strong that day. So watching people having to learn how to work together to get to where they needed to go was was really inspiring, and I think that um, learning about the dugout canoe specifically was was great for myself and other students because we learned how to make it and we learned what it's used for, but. Uh, 
most of all, it was interesting to see students try to get into the canoe. It's, it's only about this wide. So in order to get into it, you really have to be narrow-footed and narrow-bodied. Um, <laughs> And I think, it's, I think it's an experience a lot of the students won't forget anytime soon. Um, but with that, too, we, were, we had the opportunity to go back to the community center in Lower Sioux and have some food and watch a documentary, but also learn um, different techniques on how to do quill work. I mean, so Canoes has really brought um, different traditions and, and things together. Um, Through these experiences, uh, myself and uh, most of my fellow Canoe Rising officers are here today. Uh, we created an a organization here at the U called Canoe Rising, which focuses on indigenous watercraft and is committed to teaching, but also learning about various indigenous canoes around the world. Um, and with that, we were able to do an event with the historical societies uh, Mazanak Kizige uh, program, which is a photography program for indigenous youth in the Twin Cities. Um, so we were able to take them out on Badea Nacosca with uh, the Auriga canoe and a few uh, Aluma Crap canoes. Um, and so, I, like the biggest thing for me was was being able to take these these younger students out and give them opportunities to not only experience these canoes but to to take their photography to another level and getting different perspectives on the water and off the water. Um, so Cindy actually predated me with a photo. Um, I wanted to use this one just to bring awareness of what AIS is doing, more specifically Dr. Diaz. Um, all but one of us are in this room right now where we were able to be photographed for the 150th anniversary of the College of Liberal Arts by Xavier Tavera. Um, and for me, it was this moment that really wanted, uh, really got me wanting to know more about different canoes. Um, and then it, it made me want to pass it down to my sons. And that's my biggest factor for wanting to get into education being here and to learn more about uh, indigenous canoes. Um, these are my, my two youngest sons, Atreyu on the left and Jack on the right. Um, having been a part of AIS and the canoe program has given me the ability to show them what I've been learning. But also it's given me um, a chance to show them how to create things. Um, so for my paper, I, I opted out of writing the extra 10 pages and did a, a creative project. Um, and they actually helped me to create it. Um, originally, I wanted to use a birch log. I started cutting it and ripping it in half. And I actually had an allergic reaction to it. <laughs> so I, I opted out of that and started using a slab of pine. Um, so I just traced it out started carving it with a draw knife and a jigsaw because it takes a long time with just a draw knife. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to add some designs to it as well. Um, I, I did as much as I could without power tools, but there's, there's obviously some exceptions. Um, but I did want to carve and paint it. So the symbols, I hate that word, but the symbols that you see on the paddle are, are important to me and my family. Um, on the top of the painted photo there is actually, it's kind of hard to make out, but it's the Big Dipper in the North Star um, to represent where I am right now, where my family has been for quite a long time. And then on the bottom is, is water, because without water, we wouldn't have canoes. And then the medicine wheel there is, is uh, more for the communities that I've worked with and then also for my wife and my sons who are both, who are all uh, boys Fort Ojibwe. And then the bottom symbol there is the infinity symbol of the Métis people, uh, which is my family. And then, so going forward, 
Um, I've played a very small part in this larger picture of canoe resurgence in the Twin Cities area. Um, but with the ongoing efforts of the U of M and the AIS department, um, where did I go? And canoe rising, got to plug that. Uh, the healing properties of canoes will continue to vitalize and connect indigenous communities and their youth to traditional watercraft. And so I invite everybody in this room, given Dr. Diaz gives permission to join us next spring when the waters are on thawed and to get out on the water. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures here because this is one of the first times I was on the outrigger canoe. And the man in the back uh, steering us up the river is Mario Benito. And, and I'm hoping that he can come back soon to teach us some more. And with that, I say chimiquich. Yeah, questions, comments, compliments, everything's accepted. I'll just remind you all to stand up when you talk in response. Get this for the first lady did the lacrosse sticks. <laughs> uh, should I should I stop using Tinder and just start playing lacrosse? Yes. All right. right, right, right. Yes. There you go. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, cool. I know other people who have met like their fiancés at lacrosse. <laughs> other questions? <laughs> Okay, this is for all three of you, just because I do want to thank you all so much for sharing your passion and your talents and your art. And like, this is truly a gift to be able to hear you speak today about all of these things. And so then maybe, I don't even know if I have a question besides for thanking you, but I'm always just interested in like how people got impassioned by things in the first place. If there was really, I heard a lot of like familial roots and like a lot of things about being passionate about, um, just like about like history and what it means to you going forward and what you want to spread to this world because art is a way how we spread stories and how we spread change and so I don't know if there's like if you want to share any mentors that you've had in your life or someone who makes you really passionate about keep going forward you can do so with that but really I just wanted to thank you any responses up there As a beater, um, I beat it since I was uh, in teenage years, and I went to the higher survivor school, and that's how I learned how to beat. And I wanted to beat mostly because, well, first to start off, because I didn't know too much about my culture, but because I couldn't afford beads, you know, for, or an outfit or nothing, so I wanted to make my own outfit. But after I got the passion of actually doing it and realizing that it is part of me and it's a part of my culture, and it's also an amazing thing too to be a, a artist. I didn't know it was a part. Of Art, even you know, I just did it because it was beating, because it was part of you know just what we were, uh, my surrounding was a part of, as being part of a, a alternative school. But um, I had a few teachers. Ona Ona Kingbird was the first one that taught me how to bead, and then Boy Tiger was the one that told me the tricks of the trade of the easier things to do. But yes, I it's it's it brought me a lot of places. I did dance troops and went to uh, Amsterdam, so I went a lot. I did a lot of things with dancing. So yeah. It did. It get, brought me a lot to my culture, and thank you, Women Good. I would just like to ask all of you, um, since you brought um, your projects in, maybe so we could just see them a little bit better, because you didn't really get a good chance during your talk to show oh. to the online audience your work. Thank you. Sure. Oh. <laughs> okay, now change them. <laughs> Other comments? I knew. Yeah, you need it. So yeah, <laughs> you're talking to the world. Hello, world. <laughs> Um, I wanted, this is a question to all three of you, uh, and thank you for your presentations. Um, can you 
talk a little bit about the relationship between um, working with material and um, the intellectual projects that the, the kinds of things you're learning uh, in your studies and and um, the process of working with physical objects. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, as far as the physical object, uh, sorry. As far as the physical objects go, um, I really just kind of took a paddle that I already had and just felt it, looked at it, you know, just kind of imagined what it, what I wanted it to look like. And then just did my best to make it as even as possible because I know with a paddle, it, you know, you can't have it all crooked and one side be fatter than the other. So I mean, I just I took into consideration what I felt, and I mean, it turned out all right. But then as far as intellectual properties go, I mean, having all these different classes that cover so many different aspects of native cultures has really been beneficial. So that way I can expand on just canoe stuff. I can look at lacrosse and I can look at beading and I can look at other things too. Um, and then just wanting to pass it to Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> As a beer and an older student, but too, but yeah. Um, Coming to school as an older student is really pretty awesome too, because I you know I have a life experience too, along with learning again. It's probably learning my culture as that part too. But as the bee work itself, it's um, sometimes I just bead and I express different designs by I just things come to me. But sometimes you know it's just takes. But yeah, you do have to have a good heart. You have to have a good mind just to work with bees and stuff, and it takes a lot of patience and. As far as the educational part, it's I get at least I can go to Apollo now and say, hey, I know my history of why, you know, Columbus did not discover me. I was here already. I know before and after Columbus was here, and how we are very, very grateful to be here as because we only the ten percent that did make it through. You know, we were all supposed to be genocide. We were all supposed to be died off and all that. You know, but we are here, and it's cool that to know that we are still bringing on our generations of our culture still through Apollo and dance. So thank you. Like I mentioned before, my first experience with lacrosse was a Dartmouth t-shirt. So it wasn't until I moved up here that I actually learned it was a native sport. And then I went to the Field Museum in Chicago, actually, and I saw artifacts from my tribe, the Sac and Fox tribe, of lacrosse sticks and double ball. And then I also know at my Palo they also display lacrosse sticks. So I hadn't even known that was really a part of my culture, so that was really exciting. And then up here, I probably know about two or three stick makers, so, or probably at least three or four. Um, but like a lot of people don't know that a lot of them just play so I was like it's important to me to know and learn how to make a stick so I can pass it on to future generations I can teach my nieces and nephews so it was just important for me to learn how to make it and after I finished it I was really excited I was really happy and I just wanted to go play lacrosse <laughs> other questions comments I would just like to say, uh, is it working? I would just like to say that um, I'm like proud of my daughter, that uh, she's connecting with her culture. And I can uh, relate to all the people that have discussed all the various projects. And I wanted to say congratulations for all their projects and all the time they spent. Because without education and without dreams, um, we could be part of the vanishing race that uh, Edward S. Curtis tried to uh, document. And I want to congratulate everybody in this room for being here to support all the people. And I want to say miigwech, I want to say pilamayaye, I want to say wopila. And I you know, strongly encourage this uh, program. It's Minnesota is one of the more, most more progressive states. And I want to thank all the people that you know made the uh, University of Minnesota, what it is. It's kind of like one of the best institutions that I've ever encountered. And I wanted to thank everybody in here. Also want to unplug the Vietnam veterans. 
I'm a survivor. I've got PTSD. I've got all those issues, and I know names from the different reservations. I went to the, I, w I know some people from the 82nd Airborne that were from Sustain, and I know some Pine Ridge people. I think one of the presenters, uh, last name, uh, he was with the 173rd Airborne. But I know a lot of the people. I'm uh, just completed my 24th Sundance, and I pierce, and uh, I pierce with the medicine horses out of. Uh, Eastern Montana, on the Crow Agency. Um, but I just think today was fantastic. I am glad I stayed. I came over here last Wednesday expecting to eat <laughs> turkey <laughs> and just you know leave the next day. And but um, I got uh, talked into staying, and I really, really, really um, heartfelt from my heart that you know everybody's doing good, and I just. I'm thankful for all the efforts that all the people in the state of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota are here to help the people to like um, discover themselves, discover who they really are. And everything I feel comes from my heart. I, I, I want to thank everybody in this room, all the students, and all the people that have made this possible. And I, that's all I've got to say is really thank you. Miigwech from my heart. Um, I don't think it's, I think we'll take a break there. I think those are really good words to end up.